Okay. Looks like we're recording. All right. Um, so I'm so excited to introduce Mitzi Beasley. Um, she's, you know, she leads our teaching team and um, she's going to be teaching us today on Isaiah chapters 28 through 39. And a little bit about Mitzi. She is a Danville native who married her kindergarten and Sunday school classmate, Jimmy. Uh, before settling down with him and having three kids, you could find her snow or water skiing on her lunch breaks while working at Club Mediterranean Vacation Resorts or selling corporate communication software in Silicon Valley. She has called Mothers Together home for almost 10 years and is so thankful she doesn't have to mom alone. Amen to that. Amen. <laughs> I feel like it is so nice to um, be able to have all you moms to mom with. So take it away, Mitzi. Thank you, Kelly. It's so nice to be doing this. It's like so ref such a refreshing change. <laughs> like I have makeup on <laughs> and I got my kids out of the house for a hot minute. So thank you, ladies. I wish it could be in person. Um, but at least we can be together in this way for now. So right off the bat, I'm going to make a like COVID confession. Um, during all of the sheltering in place on one of our many bike rides heading out, I saw that my son was wearing his old ratty shoes. And I said, buddy, why aren't you wearing the new shoes? I got you. What's going on? And his eyes well up with tears. And he's like, mommy, I don't know how to tie my shoes. So like immediate dagger to the heart of mom guilt. And I look at my husband and I was like, this is a parenting fail, not a mom fail. We're both going to own it. And we both need to correct it. This is like, you know, clearly something between like all the baby proofing for his younger siblings and always rushing out the door. And he also did this annoying thing where he would like tie a bunch of strings together and like tie our cupboards closed and stuff. So I made this like mandate of like no strings. And apparently, you know, we showed him a couple times, but we just dropped the ball on this. And it's in stark contrast to being an 80s baby myself, my mom helping me out to learn how to tie my shoes by tying a long string to my crib slat. So I could sit in my crib and practice tying a bow and tying my shoes. So those are like two extremes. <laughs> and I was really good at tying my shoes by the time I was like three. So apparently we should have done it more like that. Um, but it's just that terrible feeling and wanting to do right by your kids that we all want to avoid, right? And we have the, all these kind of weird choices to make right now during the pandemic. And it's like we're choosing between something yucky and another something yucky. And you can't really win and all we want to do is obviously do the right thing for our kids. So um, the thing that's kind of been coming to my mind is it's a little silly, but it just helps me stay grounded is that line from Frozen 2, just do the next right thing. How's it go? Do the next right thing. I can't sing it all. I have no business singing, but I've had these songs in my head. So you guys are going to now in like off tune. So you're welcome. Um, but I keep thinking that. And today we're going to be looking at a king in Isaiah that was known as a righteous king, one of the few righteous kings of um, the, the um, Israelites. They had 20 kings. They only had five good ones, and he's one of the five. So we're going to look at the things that he did right, and he was able to rely on what he knew about God so that he could go into the unknown with confidence. So that's our big idea today. As Kelly mentioned, we're going to learn how to go into the unknown because of the known. So first we're gonna look at what we know about Isaiah so far this year. We're a little more than halfway through and earlier in the year, Eliana shared that Isaiah had this vision of God's holiness and people's sin and just the huge discrepancy between the two. And they were um, just committing all kinds of terrible acts and have turned their backs from him um, oppression, injustice, perversion. And he just came in and said, this is a line I'm drawing and you're crossing it and that you have everything upside down. And so our passages today, chapters 28 through 39, if you want to follow along in your Bible, continue a little bit of the same and set the background for what Hezekiah, what situation he goes into so that we can see what he does um, so that he can do the next right thing and go into the unknown confidence. So in verse 29 or chapter 29, verse 16, it says, you turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. 
Shall what is formed say to who formed it, he did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, he knows nothing? So this is more of the same that we have heard along the um, process of studying Isaiah. But in this particular set of chapters, there's a threat to Israel from a big bad country called Assyria. And at the time, they were the most feared fighting unit in the world. And they had a particular reputation for brutality. They were organized. They had um, the best weapons. And they would just come roll up on countries. And they'd be like, no, you win. We don't want to fight you. We're just going to surrender. Um, so the Israelites were understandably very scared. And Isaiah comes in to tell them, um, to warn them, because they are thinking that of going to, um, excuse me, Egypt for help. And Egypt, like a couple hundred years before, they had enslaved them and God brought them out of slavery and rescued them and took them away from this horribly oppressive Pharaoh. And now they're thinking, we have this threat from Assyria, we should go to Egypt and get help. And it was a bad idea. And Isaiah makes it very clear. He says, woe to the obstinate children in chapter 30, verse one, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, keeping sin upon sin without consulting me, who look to Pharaoh for help and protection, to Egypt for shade and refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. So I want you guys to be thinking as we're going into this, um, you know, what did, how did Hezekiah face this unknown? Be thinking, what is your Assyria? What's making you, making you feel threatened right now? And unfortunately, there's probably several things to choose from because of the state of the world. And what is your Egypt? What's the thing that you're tempted to turn to, but it's probably not going to be effective and it might even backfire as Hezekiah is telling the Israelites. So I know for me, there's a lot of chocolate and Amazon shopping at my house and both of those things immediately backfire. So um, Isaiah is also telling them to listen to hope that throughout all these warnings we've gotten all year, he's woven in a message of comfort and hope. And one that's here in our passages for today is chapter 30, 18 through 19. It says, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry out for help. But they are not listening. So uh, we're going to look at a few things that Hezekiah did to go into the unknown with confidence. And the first thing was that he followed the Lord's commands. He followed scripture. And what I picture it like back in his day would be like an entourage, oh, excuse me, an entourage of little old men following him around with scrolls, um, which would be really weird if we were like in the grocery store walking around with a bunch of little old men with scrolls. But he had at least the 10 commandments and King Solomon's wisdom. So the Proverbs that are in the book, book of Proverbs. And he used those commands and wisdom to correct the sins of his father. So his father was right before him and he had a completely opposite view. He was leading Israel astray, as we mentioned before. And basically they were like doing all the thou shalt not, thou shalt not. They were thou shalting all over the place. Like, um, so he went in and he smashed a lot of popular false idols um, and rebuilt the temple, established worship and stopped bribes. So right away, he just followed what God's word said and went in and cleaned house. We have the benefit of hindsight. So he was listening, following the word and then listening to Isaiah and Isaiah was telling him in chapter 30, 31, verse six, your enemies will be, will be overcome by a sword, not of man. And Isaiah just went on faith. We have the, the benefit of hindsight, of looking back at history and examples of prophecy and promise, each one fulfilled by God. So one of the ways that we can rely on God's word is because it never changes. So I've had the other Frozen 2 song in my head that some things never change. We can rely on certain certainties. Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, what has been will be again. There's nothing new under the sun no new sin that God hasn't seen. So the Israelites' sin is not new to God. Our sin is not unique. Every sticky situation 
we can apply scripture. So real quick plug for that. I do this devotional, uh, here we go, with my kiddos. It's called Sticky Situations. And it's great. It just has like a quick um, blurb, multiple choice, and a Bible verse. So it's been really neat with a chance to slow down a little bit. And we're learning to look up Bible verses in addition to tying shoes. So that's been good. Um, so the other thing about God's scriptures, it's always available. As I said, you know, we don't have an entourage of young men or little men following us around with scripture, but we do have our phones and we have Google, like we literally have it physically on us all the time. Like if you don't have Bible gateway or something like that on your phone, it's like as easy as a download. And we have this kind of sarcastic joke in our house. Like if someone's being just like a teeny bit lazy about something, we're like, oh, if only there were a way you could do that. For example, my husband came in and was like, do we have any blueberries? And I was like, yeah, they're in the refrigerator. Just went to the store. He's like, oh, awesome. But wait, are they washed? I was like, no, they're not washed. And he was like, oh, bummer. I really wanted blueberries. And I was like, it is the task of taking them out of the refrigerator and running them under the water, like this insurmountable thing. I'm so sorry. I wish if only there were a way you could have blueberries, but there's not. So I joke about that. Like sometimes we think like it's too hard to read the Bible. It's like, it's not because it's right there. It's not hard to find a Bible. It's not hard to find it on our phone. But I do totally admit it's intimidating sometimes. Um, it's an even intimidating for me, and I've been trying to read it my whole life. So one thing that's made it so much better is learning that all these books of the Bible are one big story that makes it the story of God rescuing his children that he loves and how good he is in his character. And instead of just taking it you know, piecemeal, like, okay, I can't say it, but because it's right here, but okay, you know who, like, what's a verse about fear or whatever? And like, th that's great, but even better is to take it as a whole. And there's this great study that just came out by Jenny Allen called How to Read Your Bible. It's understanding the greatest story ever told in 30 days. So if you are a little uncomfortable with tackling scripture, I would highly recommend that. Do it with a group of friends and like six weeks and you'll just get so much more out of it and she's short and sweet to the point and entertaining and all that so um so we can rely on god's scripture follow the lord's commands like hezekiah did because it's never changing always applicable and always available so the next thing that happened was i mentioned that hezekiah stopped paying bribes to Assyria. They were requiring tribute. They're basically blackmailing the Israelites saying, you need to pay us this money. And if you do that, then maybe we won't attack you. But they were known for holding people to their promises, but not um, keeping their word themselves. So not surprisingly, Assyria got very upset to not get the, these equivalent of like millions of dollars that they were paying them to not attack them. And they attack the city, they encroach on all the territories around Jerusalem, and they are standing at the city walls and boasting. And in chapter 36, verse 4, the commander is standing right outside the gate and talking to the people, and he's talking trash. He is, um, he's like, who is this Hezekiah and this God that you're trying to, um, trying to lean on? It's not going to work out for you. Like, look, what we've done so far that we've done to all of your neighbors, we're gonna come in and do it to you in the morning because they got to the wall and it was nighttime, which I don't understand how people press pause on war. Like, okay, we're all gonna go to sleep now and then I'll kill you in the morning. We'll all kill each other in the morning. But they have this <clears throat> back and forth and he's saying, you're not gonna get some kind of divine deliverance. Look at what power we have. And he tries to tell them, you know, don't listen to Hezekiah and I'll give you all this land. He bribes them to come um, with him. And he has a reputation of not keeping promises. So it's still very scary. So Hezekiah takes this information. It's out on a scroll as they write it all down, I guess, and then gave it to him. And he immediately took this information that's terrifying and went straight to the temple and laid it out before God. And he prayed this prayer. I want to read you. He says, Lord, 
O God, almighty of Israel, enthroned between cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words that Assyria has sent to insult the living God. It's true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to all these people in their lands. They've thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, deliver us from his hand so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone are God. So in genuine prayer, he exalted God and asked for this. And immediately Isaiah, who Hezekiah is listening to wisely during all of this, um, says God will send back, send them back to their land and their king will die there. And the next morning, that is exactly what happened. I doubt Hezekiah got much sleep that night, but when they awoke, the armies were rerouted. And not only that, but a hundred, it's recorded, 185,000 soldiers on the Assyrian side died in their sleep that night. And just as um, Isaiah said, the king went back and he was worshiping a, you know, a man-made God and his two sons killed him while he was in that temple worshiping. So exactly as Isaiah said, it happened. And I just get goosebumps when I think about Assyria boasting at the wall, like we have all this power, look at us. And just thinking about how quickly that was taken away. Like the second God was like, no, I'm using you to get my children's attention. And now you're done. And they were super done. Like that power belonged to God the whole time. So they were divinely delivered exactly as the Assyrian commander said would not happen. And shortly after that, Hezekiah was on his deathbed with an illness and the Lord divinely delivered him again. He gave him 15 extra years to live because of a prayer Hezekiah said that was again, genuine and giving glory to God. So there's four things we're gonna look at that he did really quick. We're gonna review that we can do too. And I have them right here. We'll see if this works. It worked when I tried earlier, but okay. Let me know if you guys can see that. It's number one, he exalted God. He laid out his concerns in prayer. He consulted scripture and he got advice from someone wise. So for our little theme today, it's Elsa. Um, and it's like a, uh, you know, not a formula for divine deliverance every time. We don't know what all's going to happen, but we know that we can try our best to do the next right thing. And one side note, when you have done, you know, all these things, you feel you've kind of checked these boxes, but genuinely in your heart, and you still have a few choices in front of you and you're not sure what to do. Somebody wise told me that probably means God's allowing you to use your creativity and follow your, your heart because he only made one you. So it's probably a him telling you to go be you within these pleasant boundaries that he set. So the last chapter is 39 and it's really short because this is where Hezekiah messes up. So he gets, that's further proof that you don't have to have a perfect life to live a godly life or be righteous. We all are blindsided at some point with pride, anger, fear, grief, greed. And in this case, it was Hezekiah's pride that got to him. Strangers come from Babylon with gifts and they're they're flattering him. They say, oh, we heard you were sick. We want to bring you this present. And there wasn't like mail that, so they brought like a group of people to him and he's had this huge opportunity to exalt God and, in, and say, yeah, God made me well. God saved my life. God struck down the Assyrians and it was so crazy. And he's so good. And instead of that, he's like, thank you. I feel better. Do you want to see all my fancy things in my palace? And it was like a um, MTV Cribs for, you know, the palace of Jerusalem. And then I just kind of picture Hezekiah coming in or, or Isaiah coming in to King Hezekiah, like, what you doing? And he says this, he says, what did, um, where were they from, from Babylon? What did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There's nothing among my treasures I did not show them. Then Hezekiah, Isaiah said to Hezekiah, 
Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord, and some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood who will be born to you, will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of Babylon. So if you don't know what a eunuch is, like I, you can look it up because we're not going into that right now. Um, but I think this is um, so crazy that the Babylonians come in and finish the job in real life right after Hezekiah, right after I keep messing up the names. Isaiah says that they're going to. He says, this is what's going to happen. And a hundred years later, it all came to pass exactly as he said. And it's all recorded in 2 Kings 24, 25. Babylon took over Jerusalem and the Israelites and they are sent into exile. It was part of Babylon's strategy for taking their power away. And God's letting all of this happen to them because they were completely turning their back on him. So it's like they were getting a 70 year timeout out of Jerusalem because God is a loving father ultimately. And he was doing the unpleasant work of disciplining his children all while keeping the promise that he made to rescue them and restore them. In chapter 35, it talks about the joy of the redeemed and a holy highway, which is like a, a physical example of the Israelites returning to their holy land, but it's also a beautiful picture pointing to Jesus as the way for all of us back to God. So, I mean, Isaiah, clearly his wisdom was given to him from God because how would he know any of this? Um, and that, that fact that God is rescuing his children and never fails at that is our best news ever for the year that we keep going back to. And there's way more good news ahead because we've had this judgment with woven in comfort and hope in here. But this chapter we just finished on 39 is where that kind of section of Isaiah ends. And from here on out, 40 through 66, where Holly's going to take us in a couple of weeks, is all the good stuff like i mean not that this wasn't good but it's all the verses that are stitched on the pillows and put on the coffee cups and it's the perfect thing to uplift us and take us into just a weird spring of 2021 where there's so much unknown so we need to help remind each other about god and his promises and focus on what we know so that like hezekiah and elsa we can go into the unknown with confidence Thank you guys. You have discussion questions for your groups and I hope you have a great